Welcome back, my dear friends, to Darktown. Now, we haven't visited the streets of Darktown in quite a while, and so it seems fitting that here, in our fourth adventure, I present you four tales of mystery, suspense, and murder. Join me as we venture through the streets of this ostensibly typical Midwestern city. But, beware, there's more than meets the eye here. <laughs> Stick with me and you'll be safe, I promise. In our first tale this evening, a man falls asleep in the luxury of his dark town apartment. But when he awakes, he finds himself in a different world. Will he ever be able to return? Listen and see. Terror is coming home to find that everything you own has been replaced with an exact copy. Renowned horror novel writer Stephen King is quoted as saying. Perceiving threats through natural intuition helped our ancestors to stay alive. Most of the time we can quickly guess if something is a threat to us, or not. Such as a falling boulder, or having a gun pointed at us. There is that space between what we think is a threat, and what is not one. This is vagueness, or ambiguity. A dictionary definition for ambiguity is the quality of being open to more than one interpretation. Inexactness. Our brains can't exactly guess if something is a threat by looking at it, like a creepy mask or a clown. There is nothing wrong with a mask or a clown. There's just something a little off about those two things. It's just unnatural. Let's say that you walk down the stairs to get yourself a glass of water in the middle of the night, after everyone else has gone to bed. It's so dark in your house that you need to have a hand against the wall just to get downstairs. You start to hear little noises that you normally would have ignored because you've heard them so many times. All of a sudden, you hear and feel breathing on the back of your neck when you thought you were alone, and turn around to see nothing there. Well, something happened to me that might never be explained. This experience wasn't some kind of lucid dream or a hallucination. It was real. I was in shock and it took a little while for my mind to reason with itself and accept the alien situation that I was in. How else would I just wake up one night with a tattoo of the number three on my upper thigh in a place that I've never been to before? A week ago from tonight, I woke up to find myself strapped to a chair with a black blindfold over my whole face. I thought I was hearing voices that sounded exactly like my own. Next, some unknown force took off the blindfold, and I found myself in a dark room where I could barely see a single thing. A light then abruptly appeared and made a humming noise, and I saw that I was in a small room surrounded by six other people, all of whom looked exactly like me. We were all silent. We had no idea what we could say that would be relevant to what we were seeing. Hello, a muffled voice said over an echoing speaker. You are all probably in shock at this moment, and have nothing to say that would put any of you at ease. You may notice the uh, similarities between yourselves. Where the fuck are we? We all said in unison, and then sharply went quiet, because we were so shocked to have had the identical reaction. Jinx. It's alright. Your reaction is completely normal. 
Who we are is unimportant. It's the question of who all of you are is what you should direct your attention towards. Are all of you you? Or are all of you individuals just like someone you may make awkward eye contact with on the street? The mysterious man was not making any of us feel better. <laughs> After all, We'd all woken up, strapped to chairs in a dark room, and found six other people in the same situation, that all looked and talked exactly like me. And I had nothing to worry about. <sighs> That's madness. Like I said before, anything that I say by this point will not aid in calming any of you down, so it would be useless to even attempt to do so. There is just one explanation I will give you before we all leave. There are seven of you joining us here today. All of you appear identical, down to that little freckle you have on the back of your left hand. I looked over to my left hand and saw that there was that little freckle right underneath my pointer finger. The truth is, that almost all of you are copies. There is just one exception. By this point, I was, for some weird reason, actually starting to calm down. I must have been the real me. Isn't it obvious? You are all, by this point, assuming that you are the real you. <laughs> Am I right? Ah, this is where you are wrong. How could I be wrong? I must be the actual Joel. I know that to be a fact. I have all of my memories, don't I? What were the rest of these people thinking? We took the original one of you and copied your consciousness into the six other bodies that we created. And then we strapped you all to one of these chairs. You will all be set free. And you will not be harmed by us ever again. But there is one catch. One of you will be able to go back and live your life the way it was before. And all of the others will need to start over. The ones of you who aren't so lucky to end up back in the place where they fell asleep. Will probably start planning to go to where you live now and replace yourself with a person who is living the life that you believe to be your own. We will make sure that you are not able to harm the one of you who gets to go back to the way things were. Ah, this can't be happening, I remember saying to myself. There was a one in seven chance that things would go back to the way things were. What felt like only a few breaths and blinks ago. After the man stopped talking, everything faded to black, and I woke up in a bed that was not my own, across from a huge glass wall outlooking snowy mountains. My chest dropped into my stomach. I wasn't at my house. My girlfriend wasn't right next to me. And instead of a German Shepherd at the foot of my bed, there was a laptop that looked like my own with a piece of paper on top. This is what the paper said. Dear number three, welcome to the Dolomites in Italy. This beautiful mountain range is elevated at 10,968 feet above sea level. And it is where you have found yourself living. You will find a safe in the closet that will contain all of your financial papers, passports, a birth certificate, and other things of that nature. You do not need to worry about working. We have provided you with enough wealth to live comfortably for the remainder of your years, and there will not be a language barrier when communicating with the locals. You will not be able to do a reverse search of your face online, but you can follow the original Joel online 
and will be able to peer into his life. But it will not be possible for you to contact him in any way. Now, go out there and go on some adventures. Find a special friend and treat yourself every now and then. You are still young and you have many more years in front of you. I felt so stuck. I haven't left my three-bedroom house yet. Groceries were delivered yesterday, so I've been fine. I'm just sitting in front of this window looking at an old photo album. It has all the photos from my first birthday all the way up to my last few days of my old life. But there was one slide missing in the photo album. I guess it was symbolic of something. Then I went into Facebook to find Joel. And at the top of his wall he had 120 likes. <sighs> wow, I said to myself. I'd never gotten that many likes before. The photo was of Joel on one knee proposing to our girlfriend of seven years. Maybe that was supposed to be the last picture in the photo album. But... I will only be able to see how one of the seven Joels lives the rest of their life through a Facebook and an Instagram page. I will never be at my wedding. I will never be able to meet my first child. I will never be able to sit down in a chair in the office of the job that I was working to have. All I can do is start over. Us humans live in a very strange world, which inspires so many questions that even the best of our thinkers don't have explanations for. We seek out answers, launching rockets into the depths of space never to be seen again. We send boats into the deepest parts of the ocean in order to discover new places. But our brains are just too fragile to handle some horrifying truth. Well, do you think he was the lucky one who got to return to Darktown? Maybe his luck was in not being the one to return. In our second story this evening, we investigate a case of sibling rivalry gone bad. I've always hated my twin brother, Richard. It was a liquid hatred that slithered through my body like an ice-cold vapour. His speech, his mannerisms, his style of dress caused me to cringe with disdain. Years of living in his shadow, enduring his endless taunts and sickening arrogance, planted the seed of revulsion and the desire to rip his heart out. As kids, he was, blatantly, favoured by our parents, while I was labelled the difficult one, and the contempt we felt for one another because of this was palpable. Through the years, our conversations were always peppered with snide remarks and criticisms. There was never any warmth or shared moments of affection, just a barrage of accusations and hidden agendas. The day he died, I rejoiced. I'm sure that sounds heartless, maybe even a bit psychotic, but it's the truth. There was no outpouring of emotion or tears of sorrow. I lacked any feelings of remorse. I felt nothing. Richard's death was inconsequential, a minor distraction, which was easily disregarded. I viewed my parents' overwhelming grief as tedious. Their constant whimpering made me want to vomit. I would snicker under my breath whenever they would mention my brother's name, and then crumble into an emotional heap. Their devastation was always met with a drawn-out yawn and a vindictive smirk. 
because I knew how much these people despised me. I was a reminder of what they had lost, and it was delicious. At his funeral, I looked on with eyes clouded with amusement as I watched my mother make a spectacle of herself by collapsing onto Richard's coffin and repeatedly screaming, Why? As my father tried to console her, our eyes met, and again I smiled, for I knew the truth. They had murdered the wrong son. Yes, Darktown has its share of mysterious goings on, that's for sure. <laughs> now, on to our third tale for this evening. A man has been suffering bad dreams for almost all of his life. Will it be any different this evening? Let's listen and find out. It calls itself the Onyx, the Black, and the Darkness. It is an ominous and otherworldly thing, slowly and painfully driving me to my grave since I was a child. I can remember our first encounter with clarity. The bulb in my nightlight had burnt out. And Daddy and Mommy were already in bed. No one was left to protect me. The creature walks hand in hand with the darkness of night. Undetected, unexpected, yet perpetually feared. You see, this entity preys viciously on the weak of mind, the innocent, the unknowing. It is undetectable in the first moments of its arrival. No warning is given no chance to prepare. It is simply there with you, whether you want it to be or not. It's followed me for years now. The twentieth anniversary of when it first showed itself to me is approaching, and it knows I am near the point of surrender. The Onyx has mastered the art of enforcing psychological exhaustion upon its victims. Things go quite smoothly through it, when it has known you since your childhood, as it has me. Most people would recognize it upon seeing it. It has no real shape or mass. It's just that dim, wispy cloud of hellish darkness crawling up your bedroom wall and looming in silent weight of your surrender to weariness from the day. I am very much aware of the fact that it watches me, invisible during the day, blatantly surrounding in the night. The moment light is extinguished with the simple flick of a switch, it exists, dominant and evil. The Onyx has been gracious enough to inform me that tonight will be my final encounter with it. Not that it's going anywhere. Only me. I have no say in the matter, no control. I am under its merciless command. I am given no choice but to accept my fate and my final task. To lie in agonizing wait of the final visit of the Onyx. I'm starting to shiver. Oh God, I can already feel it. The sensation of several weights laid across my body is abrupt and powerful. Pressing me into the mattress. I can't move. My muscles have stiffened to stone. I dare only to move my eyes, and I watch as the onyx slivers under my closed door and into the room. It watches me from the foot of my bed. I am helpless, ensnared vulnerably with its insidious contemplation. It makes its way to the side of the bed, then arches its grotesque form over me, slithering what feels like a skeletal hand over my body. It towers over me, and its darkness overtakes me in its entirety one last time. Its delicate mantle of blackness glides across my face. I'm reminded briefly of a gothic and tattered bride's veil. 
The onyx hovers to the darkest corner of the room, taking its usual route up the wall and onto the ceiling above my bed. It stares triumphantly down on me, and stays that way for some time, seeming to relish the moment. Finally, it begins its descent. I close my eyes. Several sharp objects, almost like claws, dig into the sides of my face, leaving behind what I'm sure are angry, bleeding gashes. I can't help it. I scream. The skeletal hands are closing over my skull. Then, suddenly, what feels like a third hand, decked with needle-like fingers, forces itself down my throat. I gag and shriek hoarsely as the spindly fingers dig through my insides, burning and tearing with every careless movement. Distinctively, I feel the hand move with purpose as it closes over my panicking heart. It has me. The fingers tighten. My vision turns black. A strangled cry beyond my own recognition escapes my obstructed throat. The claws gripping my head begin to tighten as well. Pressure builds inside my brain as the skull begins to crack. I experience every little split, every microscopic break. Warm liquids trickle down the sides of my face, into my eyes, into my open mouth. My body is made of agony. And then, there is... Nothing. They find me like that a few days later. Eyes glazed and mad with anguish. Skull in shards with unknown fluids leaking out. Blood seeping from the ragged lips and gathering in a large pool on my bruised, unmoving chest. Mysterious, ink-black handprints stain my skin in various places. My heart, they discover, is oddly missing. Gone. Nowhere to be found. God, what could have done this? The officers and investigators ask one another. The remnants of my eyes roll around rapidly in their sockets, looking frantically in all directions. It's right in front of you, I tell them. But their ears are deaf to my warnings. Their eyes are blind to the things of this netherworld of darkness and ceaseless torment. I watch the creature follow them out as they leave the gruesome scene of my demise. The creature. My second shadow. My lifelong stalker. My executioner. The onyx. It's all around you. It will never leave you. Take my word. Take the word of its claimed victim. You will see it. Just wait until dark. Hmm, so when I tell you it's only a story and wish you sweet dreams, I do so dearly hope it doesn't end up for you like it did for that poor man. Now, on to our final story of the evening. One of Darktown's fine members of the police constabulary is worried about a strange figure that he sees outside his apartment. He's also worried about home invasion. Where could this all lead? Let's listen and find out. It's true what they say. Monsters do exist. They have always existed and will continue to do so. They live in our minds infesting them with suicidal and horrible thoughts. Some of us give in, some of us don't. It's the battle that never ends. But there are more strange and fearsome things. The things that lurk in the shadows and only come out when it's dark on our planet. They feast on us, on our fear, our guilt and every bad emotion we have. This is a story about one of those things. 
those things that want to destroy our people. Kill us. Torture us. I stare at the TV screen. Just some classic bullshit about politics again. My mind wanders off to several different thoughts. My wife, my job, my family. I work for the local police station and, since there are rarely any crimes in this town, we mostly eat donuts, drink coffee and get fat. Although I wouldn't call myself that. I go to the gym every day and try to eat healthy. Although tonight, I have a bag of chips with me. A thought comes rushing into my mind. It was about a case we had last month. A man was washed ashore. He was dead, obviously, and covered in bite marks. And in some parts of his body there was flesh ripped out. His eyes were gone as well. We thought sharks, but they don't usually just bite some dead prey and leave it. No. There was something quite off about this bizarre incident. We had to close the case since there were no suspects and the man's body was too destroyed to identify him. I felt a breeze of cold air the moment I sat up from the couch. The kitchen window was open. I got up to close it, and as I did, I saw a figure standing outside, looking at our window. I was a bit creeped out, I'm not going to lie. I hesitantly closed the window and then shut the blinds, thinking about how creepy this actually was. I yawned and opened the bedroom. My wife was long asleep, so I kissed her on the cheek, dressed down to my underwear and silently got into bed and pulled the covers over my body. I was awoken at about 3 a.m. from knocking on the door. We lived in an apartment on the fourth floor, so it wasn't likely that any homeless person could have gotten in. Yet I got up, put on a pair of shorts, since it was summer outside, and went to look. I heard the knock again, and this time it was more violent. I said, Hello? And immediately regretted saying it. From the other side of the door, I heard an old man's voice. Go. Run. They'll get you. Run. Run. They will eat you. And then, there was silence. I listened for breathing, but there was none. In fact, it was way too quiet, more than it should be. We lived under a bar, and people go there every night. I was really creeped out when I, once again, felt cold air rush up my back. I looked behind me and saw the window in the kitchen open again. What? I'd closed it when I went to sleep. I walked slowly to the kitchen and to the window. I saw the same figure still standing there. I shut the window fast, locking it with a lock that we had over each window. I shut the blinds, took my gun from the safe and put it on my nightstand. Just, just in case. I went back to bed, but it's needless for me to say that I didn't close my eyes once again that night. The next morning, once I woke up, my wife was cooking breakfast already. I entered the kitchen, still tired from the sleepless night, said good morning to her and asked if she had opened the window at night. She denied doing it, so I was left thinking about this all day long. I won't bother telling you about my work day, because it was boring as hell. Nothing ever happened in this small town. I got home before my wife, because she works at the mall and she comes home at eight. I had about three hours for myself, so I decided to check out the window once again. I opened the blinds and let the sun shine in. The dark figure was obviously gone. Nothing seemed off or out of the ordinary. The window wasn't broken or anything, 
and I had no explanation as to how it had opened, if none of us had done it. We don't have strong winds here, not ones that will blow open a shut window, definitely not. I was confused. Things like this just don't happen. I don't believe in ghosts or anything like that. I decided to throw some bad thoughts out of my head and go out to smoke a cigarette and wait for my wife to come home since she only works a few hundred meters away from here and she's on foot. Once she gets home, we order pizza for dinner, watch a movie and uh, do adult stuff. Talk, laugh, drink a bit. We go to sleep at around 1 a.m. and I check the window before we do so. It's shut. No figure standing outside this night. I go to the back door and check the lock on the door as well. Locked and no sound outside. I go back to the bathroom, turn out the lights and jump into bed. I feel cold. I wake up. My watch is unplugged. I turn around and see the bed beside me empty cold sweat is rushing down my spine. My wife is gone. I bolt upright in bed. I feel the cold again. I grab my gun and walk out of the bedroom. What I see is terrifying. Every window is open. Wide open. The cool air is blowing in. I proceed to close every window and, as I do, I call for my wife. No answer. I check the bathroom and every other room. Nothing. Finally, the kitchen. The window is the last one open there. I walk inside the dark kitchen, pointing my gun at the window. It's an intruder. I proceed to tell myself, but something inside me knows this is something worse. I don't dare to turn on the lights in the kitchen. I'm scared that I might see something I will... Well, I don't know. I slowly approach the window. Then I see it. It's my wife. Well, her face to be exact. A minute later, it's gone. I want to call out to her, but I can't. My mouth is dry. My hand with the gun is now shaking. I'm at the window and I see it. The figure. It's sitting on the tree. It's not a man. It has six eyes and way too many arms. It sits there, smiling with its huge mouth. I don't know what to do. One's mind can only process what it understands. Then, suddenly, the creature lunges at me, trying to grab me with its long and nail-covered fingers. I fire a shot at it. The bullet just bounces off, so I try pushing it away from myself. It tries to eat my face, but I use all of my strength I have in me to push its jaws away from me. Then, an idea sparks into my mind. I'm going to burn myself and this fucker with it. Our flat is a gasoline tank. It's not much, but it might be enough to light this apartment on fire. I know this sounds crazy but I think it's the only chance I've got. With all of my strength, I push this thing off me and throw a kitchen knife at it. It screams a terrifying scream and growls in pain. This gives me the split second to close the window and rush out of the room and shut the door behind me. I feel pain in my wrist. Blood is soaking in my shorts as well. I take the gasoline container from the washing room and open it, splashing the gasoline all over the floor. And what surprises me is that I hear no sound from the kitchen whatsoever. I empty half of it and proceed to walk back to the kitchen. 
I wait for a moment, then brace myself for the worst and walk inside. My wife is standing in front of me. She wraps her arms around me and starts whispering to me, and I almost believe that it's her. But there is one thing. Since when does my wife have red eyes? I scream and punch her away. Immediately her skin starts peeling off, revealing the creature. I smile and splash the remaining gasoline around me and on the creature as well. It stares at me for a moment. I look into its eyes of hell. Then I pull out my lighter, and just as the thing jumps on top of me, I drop it on the ground. I feel sharp pain, and then I'm falling into the black abyss. Local newspaper reports. Four killed in apartment fire. The fire supposedly started from the fourth floor and lit up the whole building. It took two days for the firemen to completely extinguish the fire, which could have been caused by a gasoline explosion. The bodies of four persons were found. All were men. The most destroyed body had bizarre marks on it. Parts of the man's body were bitten out, and his eyes were gone. So, four tales for you this evening. I hope you enjoyed those as much as I did. It was a real pleasure to invite you all back to Darktown. Now, we haven't been there for quite a few months, but I certainly enjoyed my visit. I hope you did as well. Um, if you're not familiar with the first three compilation videos, then I'm linking to them at the end of this story, so please do check them out. They do well, in my opinion. They do all work well together, and they put you into this town and all of its mysteries and goings-on. <laughs> Well, that's enough for me for one evening. Guess what? I'm back with you on Wednesday with another story. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye.